Let's talk to Baroness Fox of Buckley, who is, of course, Director of the Academy of Ideas, non-affiliated peer. Claire, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. How are you doing? I'm fine, but like everyone else, you know, very frustrated. Yes, you sound a lot calmer than I do, because I have not been calm literally since uh, really Sunday, I think. I think I, I think actually trying to stay calm is one of the, the contributions we have to make because in some ways I just think it becomes so demoralising to be in a state of fury all the time. Mm. So I'm trying to get a sense of perspective and trying to, you know, because people are getting demoralised, so I think it's important that we have a kind of future orientation. Yeah, We will be free and so on and so forth. So. I mean, we've got, I think, um, something to play from you in the Lords about extending the restrictions, which we'll get to in a second. But I mean... You know, just from the point of view of, of pure academia, you know, I'm not sure what the government is looking at that's telling them that we're in a worse situation now than we were this time last year. Well, I mean, we aren't in a worse situation than we were like this time last year. All the figures, all the stats, all the data, and I don't think that should be the only thing that we consider. But if you look at the data on COVID-19, we are actually doing, as they say, very well. Mm. My argument, of course, and increasingly more and more people are agreeing with this, is you can't just see the whole of society through the prism of the assessment of COVID. Because at this stage, we now have to say that any cost benefit analysis means that what we're doing to fight one very small challenge, and it's a small challenge now, which is this horrible virus, is outweighed by all of the costs, the collateral damage, as it were, of carrying on keeping people restricted under, you know, under the diktat of a government that can tell you how to live the most intimate aspects of your life. Mm. And that is the problem, isn't it? Because what we've been talking about, you and I, and many other people over the course of the last year, is, you know, we have to be very careful how this is managed. We have to be very careful what powers the government thinks it has. And it struck me over the weekend at the G7 that, you know, all of these people who are elected, uh, who do run countries, um, they're all paid by the public purse of each of those countries. You know, you know, Bar Joe Biden flies around Britain in the Air Force One, all paid for by the American taxpayer. You know, Boris Johnson takes everybody to the Eden Project, all paid for by us. You know, the EU turn up, uh, Macron turns up. They're all employed by us. And it suddenly struck me there's something wrong with this picture because they're not listening to us. But we're being forced to listen to not only to them, but to do what they're telling us to do. Well, I think, I think it's, you know, the, the difficulty we've got, maybe you and I, is that quite a lot of people are not agreeing with us, right? Mm. I mean, there's a, I, I still think that probably the majority of people think, well, it's only four weeks, better safe than sorry, and so on. And I think what the government's role is in that is to face that down. Because one of the reasons why people feel like that is because they're, conf you know, there's a huge amount of information that's quite scary. Mm. All people are trying to do what is best for society. You know, some of it will be cynical, like, don't want to go back to work. It's lovely sunny days, you know, don't mind for an extra few weeks. But overall, what that means is handing over our agency, our ability to make decisions to mm. the government. Yeah. And so what I want the government to do is to, to have a bit of courage, because I think they're looking at the polls thinking, oh, well, if we carry on doing this, you know, we're not even going to be that unpopular. Mm. Uh, and maybe they're right. But that the point is, at some point, you've got to do something on the basis of principle on what's right. And for me, the continuation of the trashing of the economy. Just when I was in the Lords yesterday, the government minister that I was asking the question of, we got less than a minute, by the way, mm. each. Um, the government minister that I was asking, you know, he was sort of saying, well, try and put yourself in our shoes to see what it's like making the decisions. Mm. And he was kind of almost quite chirpy, saying, well, you know, I'd like to stay optimistic. I don't want all this negativity. And it's like, don't you realise the despair if you work in the events industry, yeah. if you work in the travel industry, but also just if you are, if you want for once to just be able to have spontaneity, I mean, that's what's lacking, isn't it? It's not just a question of saying, I want to go to the pub. Mm. It's that I just want to go out in the day and see what happens and see whether I yes. want to go and meet mates or not. And the fact that I have to think, what are the rules? Am I allowed? Mm. Is that possible? That changes who we are as citizens. It yeah. makes us lesser 
in my view. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. But for me, it's not just about that, But even though that's very important. It's also about the size of the businesses we're talking about here, the size yeah. of hospitality, the size of the events business, the music business, you know, the numbers of people, the thousands, tens of thousands of people employed, uh, all of whom pay tax, the businesses that all pay tax. I mean, I go back to last year, and I remember hearing a guy who won't, uh, runs a theatre somewhere in the West End, and he said, you know, last year we paid £700,000 in VAT to the government. And they said, how much are you paying this year? And he went, none, nothing. You know, exactly. I mean, that, you can't tell me that doesn't have some kind of long term effect. But let's have no. a watch, uh, Claire, just as we as we're talking about the Lords and your appearance there yesterday. Uh, let's let's look. Let's look at that and listen to it. I call Baroness Fox of Buckley. The minister has said several times there are grounds for optimism. Really, doesn't he realise that this delay has caused despair? The minister urged opponents to sit in the seats of decision makers. Can I urge the Minister to sit in the seats of the trashed events industry today and those who are likely to lose their jobs in hospitality, sport, theatre and so on? I appreciate that many people in the public remain nervous of living with the virus despite the wonders of the vaccine, but isn't it the job of government to lead with courage, to reassure people not to be unduly frightened or succumb to fatalism? and to protect the unquantifiable, non-COVID-related social fabric of society that you are tearing up. Very well said. Um, and as you pointed out, the, uh, the reception that you got for that, uh, Claire, was not exactly particularly encouraging. But let me ask you about a couple of other things that are going on. I mean, the care homes this morning, we're being told, uh, anyone who works in them is going to be forced to have a vaccination. I feel slightly uneasy about that. Um, what do you think? Oh, I'm absolutely furious about this one. I'm not calm on this question. OK. Because I think that um, the the government's own approach had been to say we won't comp make this compulsory for care home uh, staff. We'll encourage them. That's the best way. And they're absolutely right. But the implication is that care homes had COVID in them because care home workers weren't vaccinated. Well, we know that's not true. Mm. We actually know that the reason why COVID got into care homes was much uh, less to do with that. And actually, if you look at what's happening in care homes at the moment, the great tragedies, the great threat to health are the continuation of restrictions until only this week, they had to have, um, you know, 14 days in isolation if they'd been out for a day into the sunshine. These inhumane rules about not being allowed to hug relatives, people having to dress in full PPE to go and see an 85 year old with dementia. Mm. If you wanna know what the threat to the health of people in care homes is, it's not unvaccinated care home workers, it's those rules. So it seems to me that this is an attempt at saying that the care home workers are potentially threatening what a horrible insult mm. to frontline workers who have worked throughout this pandemic in the most difficult situation and have had, you know, the added strain of having to deal with furious relatives, let alone do their job of substituting the lack of love and care of families who've been banned to try and make mm. those elderly people feel better. And then they're being blamed effectively. And they shouldn't. I mean, if you have got, by the way, those people who've got, loved ones in care homes, they will have been doubly vaccinated. Therefore, they are really very safe. Mm. So actually, the threat is not that care worker who, for whatever reasons, doesn't want to have the, 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 the vaccination. Mm. And, and compulsory medical intervention, apart from in extreme circumstances, I think is a very dangerous road to go down. And so much for clapping for frontline workers, know. you know, it's a disgraceful singling of them out, I think, that I really despise. I mean, people say that they do uh, insist on uh, uh, in vaccinations for certain medical staff in certain areas. And I heard somebody on the radio this morning talking about uh, that you get hepatitis C injection if you're working as a surgeon. That may well be. But there's certainly not any compulsory vaccination taking place in the NHS overall. All nurses no. are not vaccinated. If they don't want to be vaccinated, they're not, right? Yeah, I mean, look, that's why I said, apart from in very particular circumstances now surgeons and hepatitis i get it do you know what i mean yeah. and you don't have to be a surgeon we've got a shortage of care workers not not to you know and, and and they're low paid work extremely hard do jobs that sometimes people 
are, you know, looked down on, let's mm. be frank, you know, because they have to do the more intimate care of people who are very poorly often. Yeah. And I just think it's, it's to, to single them out is one thing. But all I'm saying is, why has the government done it? You know, the, they've just announced this or apparently they're going to win. I like all these things. We sit there kind of getting briefed before we have any parliamentary discussion mm. on it or any proper genuine justification. Now there's all these rumours. We're not even sure if it's true. This whole thing feels so psychologically battering. And, and I think that's one of the problems we've got. You know, mm. and I was saying a lot of people go along with restrictions. In some ways, we, rather than us being able to have a, you know, a social public debate on what we think about care homes. We're sitting on the couch waiting to find out what the next cabinet decision is. And that makes you feel powerless. Mm. And it really kind of, I think, knocks the stuffing out of people. Yeah, but anyway, so. it's a very dangerous road to go down in terms of employment law. Mm. I don't like it at all. No, I don't think so either. Stay with us, Baroness, if you can. We're going to come back and talk about the People's Lockdown Inquiry. Uh, we're talking uh, to Baroness Fox of Buckley. Claire Fox, uh, to those of you who know her before she was ennobled. We're talking to Baroness Fox of Buckley. And she's been telling us about how uh, upset she is about this idea that people uh, should be uh, compulsorily vaccinated. I've got this from uh, Jean in Lewisham. I've worked as a carer throughout the pandemic. I have an autoimmune condition and will never have a vaccine because of the risk to my health. I put myself at risk for 15 months, had regular COVID tests and never tested positive. If the vaccine is mandatory for carers, I will no longer work in the sector. And I think Jean probably speaks for an awful lot of people. Claire, this is the problem they're going to have, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I mean, also, what are you, it's, it's almost like criminalising uh, care workers who don't want the vaccine as though they're irresponsible. And as I say, it's, it's blame shifting. I think when we actually do have a proper inquiry, um, a government inquiry, um, and we heard a little bit of this from Dominic Cummings, we're going to find out that the scandal of what's happened in care homes, the numbers of people who died both of COVID and the official responsibility for that, but also the number of people whose lives were taken because they were neglected in many ways because of COVID regulations um, will make, you know, the care home workers are the least of the problems at all. They're the heroes and heroines of this. Absolutely right. A lot of people were pointing out the, the, the game yesterday, I don't know if you've watched it in football, but the game yesterday in Hungary, uh, between Hungary and Portugal, where there was upwards of 61 to 64,000 people in the stadium. Victor Orban uh, is, of course, everybody's favourite Trump figure to hate in Eastern Europe. You know, nobody likes the guy. Everybody thinks he's a racist. But however, he's made a political decision. Uh, but what he has done is also asked for people to have vaccine passports to get into the game. What do you make of that? Well, of course, I mean, we all feel, well, I feel very queasy about vaccine passports because, again, it's one of those situations where you have to show your papers yeah. and um i, I mean it, it was sort of a great delight to see the the crowds at the football i mean just because that's what we all want mm. but i don't want to be in a situation where access to the public square which in a way is ours by right yeah. right we're the public um where you have to kind of ask permission and then that permission is only granted if you fulfilled a number of medical requirements so i think that that is not the way to go and I, I, as it happens, I do think um, that, that there's lots of ministers and a number of people, you know, Michael Go people have been pushing this uh, vaccine passports. It's not gone so well. There has been a bit of a backlash. Mm. I think it's united civil libertarians who've not been particularly all of them anti all of the lockdown measures. But when it comes to compulsory vaccine passports, they can see that that's a kind of biomedical state that's rather dangerous. Yes, I think um, so. Well, can you imagine if you sort of said to people, we want to make sure that, you know, you're tested to see whether you've got AIDS. We want to make sure, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And when you go to, I mean, we'd all think you can't do that, can no. you? You know what I mean? Like that would be, and there's already squeamishness in those kind of medical things when insurance companies gauge you on your medical outcomes. If the whole of society start doing it, we're basically discriminating the person that we've just, you just read out, the, the care home mm. worker. I mean, she won't be able to go to the football, she won't be able to work in a care home, and she won't be able to potentially go to the shops. Right. We can't have that, right? No, we absolutely can't. Just a couple of minutes left. Talk to, talk to us about the people's lockdown inquiry uh, that you're interested in starting up. Yeah, with. so um, if I can just hold this up in my kind of free advertising. So um, the Academy of Ideas, which I'm the director of, we got, um, if I can give it its full, we got commissioned by the Reclaim Party. Okay. Um, to, you know, a few months ago, they came to us and I thought it was a really inspired idea. They let us get on with it, which is there's going to be lots of official inquiries and they're all going to look at stats and data. 
what the people's lockdown inquiry is doing is basically it, we went and got submissions from a whole range of people on the front line as to what the collateral damage of lockdown was now, it's very important this they weren't all people who were skeptical of lockdowns you know some of them actually supported the lockdowns but mm. we asked them to consider what is the cost of these restrictions on lives. And we've got people talking about, what, uh, so the submissions and people talking about what's happening in prisons, mm. a really neglected area, but it's been inhumane. Mm. People locked in their cells for 23 hours from dentists, from care home workers, from residents, uh, from, from families, from primary school teachers. It's a living historic capsule because one of the things that I'm very keen on is that we don't forget what's happened over the last 15 months. Yeah. And that these things are not, quantitative where you can count the data but they're qualitative there are stories and so if you want it's living history so there's a website uh, um, uh, which is of course uh, people's lockdown inquiry dot co dot uk i hope people will read those submissions and recognize that we're not gonna we can't depend on the politicians to run an inquiry where we get a sense of of, of assessment of what's happened there's a brilliant essay in here actually mike on the economy and actually weighing up, you know, will there be some good things that come out of this? You know, will it will it wipe out a lot of companies that maybe didn't, you know, had been sort of uh, coasting along, as it were, mm. but really in-depth discussion. So I hope people will read it, participate, tell their own stories. And I'd like to thank the Reclaim Party for commissioning us, but uh, the Academy of Ideas take full responsibility for curating this. But we've got to tell our own history now, not let it be the statistician, sage, or the people called to the Science and Technology Committee. Our stories, or when I say our, oh, I'm in the House of Lords, Ordinary people's stories count. I'm like one of the privileged these days, I have to remember. But ordinary people's stories count. They cannot be sidelined. They can't be forgotten. The importance of talk radio for me is that you throughout have given the opportunity for ordinary people to talk. And there's been some examples on all the shows, but one in particular show where somebody phoned, you know, the father of five, who mm. phoned in in despair. Yeah. And then he came back and explained how he got through it. And there's something about hearing what it's like on the ground that most politicians haven't got a clue no. what people's lives have been like during this time. And we should not forget. No, absolutely right. Brilliant stuff. Baroness Claire Fox, thank you very much indeed. Uh, go and find that uh, uh, Academy of Ideas paper because it's called The People's Lockdown Inquiry. And keep bringing us your stories because it's important, not least because people do take notice. We don't do this because it's good for our health. In some ways, it's not very good for our health. Some people castigate us. Some people tell us uh, that we're horrible, nasty, right-wing bigots. We're not. We're telling the story of the people of this country. And that's why Talk Radio is the fastest-growing radio station on the planet.